Chapter 3 The next morning, when the Otis family met at breakfast, they discussed the ghost at some length. The United States minister was naturally a little annoyed to find that his present had not been accepted. "'I have no wish,' he said, "'to do the ghost any personal injury, and I must say that, considering the length of time he's been in the house, I don't think it is at all polite to throw pillows at him.' A very just remark, at which, I'm sorry to say, the twins burst into shouts of laughter. "'Upon the other hand,' he continued, "'if he really declines to use the Rising Sun Lubricator, "'we shall have to take his chains from him. "'It would be quite impossible to sleep "'with such a noise going on outside the bedrooms.' "'For the rest of the week, however, they were undisturbed, "'the only thing that excited any attention "'being the continual renewal of the bloodstain on the library floor.' This certainly was very strange, as the door was always locked at night by Mr. Otis, and the windows kept closely barred. The chameleon-like colour, also, of the stain, excited a good deal of comment. Some mornings it was a dull, almost Indian red, then it would be vermilion, then a rich purple, and once, when they came down for family prayers, according to the simple rites of the free American Reformed Episcopalian Church, they found it a bright emerald green. These kaleidoscopic changes naturally amused the party very much, and bets on the subject were freely made every evening. The only person who did not enter into the joke was little Virginia, who, for some unexplained reason, was always a good deal distressed at the sight of the bloodstain, and very nearly cried the morning it was emerald green. The second appearance of the ghost was on Sunday night. Shortly after they'd gone to bed, they were suddenly alarmed by a fearful crash in the hall. Rushing downstairs, they found that a large suit of old armour had become detached from its stand, and had fallen on the stone floor while seated in a high-backed chair was the Canterville ghost, rubbing his knees with an expression of acute agony on his face. The twins, having brought their pea-shooters with them, at once discharged two pellets on him, with that accuracy of aim which can only be attained by long and careful practice on a writing-master, while the United States minister covered him with his revolver, and called upon him, in accordance with Californian etiquette, to hold up his hands. The ghost started up with a wild shriek of rage, and swept through them like a mist, extinguishing Washington Otis's candle as he passed, and so leaving them all in total darkness. On reaching the top of the staircase he recovered himself, and determined to give his celebrated peal of demoniac laughter. This he had on more than one occasion found extremely useful. It was said to have turned Lord Raker's wig grey in a single night, and had certainly made three of Lady Canterville's French governesses give warning before their month was up. He accordingly laughed his most horrible laugh, till the old vaulted roof rang and rang again, but hardly had the fearful echo died away when a door opened, and Mrs. Otis came out in a light blue dressing-gown. "'I am afraid you are far from well,' she said, "'and I've brought you a bottle of Dr. Dobell's tincture. "'If it is in digestion, you will find it a most excellent remedy.' The ghost glared at her in fury, and began at once to make preparations for turning himself into a large black dog, an accomplishment for which he was justly renowned, and to which the family doctor always attributed the permanent idiocy of Lord Canterville's uncle, the Honourable Thomas Horton. The sound of approaching footsteps, however, made him hesitate in his fell purpose, so he contented himself with becoming faintly phosphorescent, and vanished with a deep churchyard groan, just as the twins came up to him. On reaching his room he entirely broke down, and became a prey to the most violent agitation. The vulgarity of the twins, and the gross materialism of Mrs. Otis, 
were naturally extremely annoying, but what really distressed him most was that he'd been unable to wear the suit of mail. He'd hoped that even modern Americans would be thrilled by the sight of a spectre in armour, if for no more sensible reason, at least out of respect for their natural poet Longfellow, over whose graceful and attractive poetry he himself had whiled away many a weary hour when the Cantervilles were up in town. Besides, it was his own suit. He had worn it with great success at the Kenilworth tournament, and had been highly complimented on it by no less a person than the Virgin Queen herself. Yet when he had put it on, he had been completely overpowered by the weight of the huge breastplate and steel cask, and had fallen heavily on the stone pavement, barking both his knees severely, and bruising the knuckles of his right hand. For some days after this he was extremely ill, and hardly stirred out of his room at all, except to keep the bloodstain in proper repair. However, by taking great care of himself, he recovered, and resolved to make a third attempt to frighten the United States minister and his family. He selected Friday, August the 17th, for his appearance, and spent most of that day in looking over his wardrobe, ultimately deciding in favour of a large, slouched hat with a red feather, a winding-sheet, frilled at the wrists and neck, and a rusty dagger. Towards evening a violent storm of rain came on, and the wind was so high that all the windows and doors in the old house shook and rattled. In fact, it was just such weather as he loved. His plan of action was this. He was to make his way quietly to Washington Otis's room, gibber at him from the foot of the bed, and stab himself three times in the throat to the sound of low music. He bore Washington a great grudge, being quite aware that it was he who was in the habit of removing the famous Canterville bloodstain by means of Pinkerton's Paragon detergent. Having reduced the reckless and foolhardy youth to a condition of abject terror, he was then to proceed to the room occupied by the United States minister and his wife, and there to place a clammy hand on Mrs. Otis's forehead, while he hissed into her trembling husband's ear the awful secrets of the charnel house. With regard to little Virginia, he had not quite made up his mind. She had never insulted him in any way, and was pretty and gentle. A few hollow groans from the wardrobe, he thought, would be more than sufficient, or, if that failed to wake her, he might grabble at the counterpane with palsy-twitching fingers. As for the twins, he was quite determined to teach them a lesson. The first thing to be done was, of course, to sit upon their chests, so as to produce the sensation of nightmare. Then, as their beds were quite close to each other, to stand between them in the form of a green, icy, cold corpse, till they became paralysed with fear, and finally to throw off the winding-sheet and crawl around the room with white bleached bones and one rolling eyeball, in the character of dumb Daniel or the suicide skeleton, a role in which he had on more than one occasion produced a great effect, and which he considered quite equal to his famous part of Martin the Maniac, or the Masked Mystery. At half-past ten he heard the family going to bed. For some time he was disturbed by wild shrieks of laughter from the twins, who, with the light-hearted gaiety of schoolboys, were evidently amusing themselves before they retired to rest. But at a quarter-past eleven all was still and as midnight sounded he sallied forth. The owl beat against the window-panes, the raven croaked from the old yew-tree, and the wind wandered moaning round the house like a lost soul. But the Otis family slept unconscious of their doom, and high above the rain and storm he could hear the steady snoring of the minister for the United States. He stepped stealthily out of the wainscoting, with an evil smile on his cruel, wrinkled mouth, and the moon hid her face in a cloud as he stole past the great oriel window, 
where his own arms and those of his murdered wife were blazoned in azure and gold. On and on he glided, like an evil shadow. The very darkness seemed to loathe him as he passed. Once he thought he heard something call, and stopped, but it was only the baying of a dog from the red farm, and he went on, muttering strange seventeenth-century curses, and ever and anon brandishing the rusty dagger in the midnight air. Finally he reached the corner of the passage that led to luckless Washington's room. For a moment he paused there, the wind blowing his long grey locks about his head, and twisting into grotesque and fantastic folds the nameless horror of the dead man's shroud. Then the clock struck the quarter, and he felt the time was come. He chuckled to himself, and turned the corner, but no sooner had he done so than, with a piteous wail of terror, he fell back, and hid his blanched face in his long bony hands. Right in front of him was standing a horrible spectre, motionless as a carven image, and monstrous as a madman's dream. Its head was bald and burnished, its face round and fat and white, and hideous laughter seemed to have writhed its features into an eternal grin. From the eyes streamed rays of scarlet light, the mouth was a wide well of fire, and a hideous garment like to his own, swathed with its silent snows the titan form. On its breast was a placard, with strange writing in antique characters, some scroll of shame it seemed, some record of wild sins, some awful calendar of crime and with its right hand it bore aloft a falchion of gleaming steel. Never having seen a ghost before, he naturally was terribly frightened, and after a second hasty glance at the awful phantom, he fled back to his room, tripping up in his long winding-sheet as he sped down the corridor, and finally dropping the rusty dagger into the minister's jack-boots, where it was found in the morning by the butler. Once in the privacy of his own apartment, he flung himself down on a small pallet-bed, and hid his face under the clothes. After a time, however, the brave old Canterville spirit asserted itself, and he determined to go and speak to the other ghost as soon as it was daylight. Accordingly, just as the dawn was touching the hills with silver, he turned towards the spot where he'd first laid eyes on the grisly phantom, feeling that, after all, two ghosts were better than one, and that, by the aid of his new friend, he might safely grapple with the twins. On reaching the spot, however, a terrible sight met his gaze. Something had evidently happened to the spectre, for the light had entirely faded from its hollow eyes, the gleaming falchion had fallen from its hand, and it was leaning up against the wall in a strained and uncomfortable attitude. He rushed forward and seized it in his arms, when, to his horror, the head slipped off and rolled on to the floor, the body assumed a recumbent posture and he found himself clasping a white dimity bed-curtain, with a sweeping-brush, a kitchen-cleaver, and a hollow turnip lying at his feet. Unable to understand this curious transformation, he clutched the placard with feverish haste, and there, in the grey morning light, he read these fearful words, Ye Otis Ghost, ye only true and original spook, Beware of ye imitations, all others are counterfeit. The whole thing flashed across him. He had been tricked, foiled, and outwitted. The old Canterville look came into his eyes. He ground his toothless gums together, and, raising his withered hands high above his head, swore according to the picturesque phraseology of the antique school, that, when Chanticleer had sounded twice his merry horn, deeds of blood would be wrought, and murder walk abroad with silent feet." Hardly had he finished this awful oath when, from the red-tiled roof of a distant homestead, a cock crew. 
he laughed a long, low, bitter laugh, and waited. Hour after hour he waited, but the cock, for some strange reason, did not crow again. Finally, at half-past seven, the arrival of the housemaids made him give up his fearful vigil, and he stalked back to his room, thinking of his vain oath and baffled purpose. There he consulted several books of ancient chivalry, of which he was exceedingly fond, and found that, on every occasion on which this oath had been used, Chanticleer had always crowed a second time. "'Perdition seize the naughty fowl!' he muttered. "'I have seen the day when, with my stout spear, I would have run him through the gorge, and made him crow for me, and twere in death!' He then retired to a comfortable lead coffin, and stayed there till evening. End of chapter 3